On session okay. four, we talk about infrastructure and logistics. The objective was to explore the infrastructure and logistical aspect of establishing and operating a battery collective. We also recognize that striving for a perfect blueprint can be paralyzing. And while focusing on realistic solution that works today can drive progress. And what we left off for you is a little takeaway question of what are your logistical wants and what are your logistical needs? Because as we shared a few times in our stories, a lot of times when we don't know what's a logistical want versus what's a logistical needs, we end up getting bogged down with a lot of the um, potential things that's going to happen, which we later realize those are just logistical wants when we have logistical needs, which is people have power outage right now, even though we don't have major disaster yet. So we felt like a lot of logistical wants were just wanting to prepare for the worst case scenario disaster. When we have real logistical needs right now, where we have spotty blackouts that happen in our community that we should be addressing now. I'd love to um, take a moment to see if anyone had a chance to sh think about what your logistical wants and what your logistical needs are for your community? I think my logistical want will be having a underground power lines and like a fiber optic. I think that will help. I've been thinking about it for years, but since I'm not in that field, I wish I was. That would help a lot of uh, areas that are prone to have tornadoes and hurricanes. Not that's the first thing when the wind blows. I notice it gets knocked down here faster than when I was in the previous states I used to live in. Yeah, the infrastructure is weak down here in Jackson, um, and they get a lot of rain. Not a lot of rain, but a lot of winds. Even though there's not a lot of tornadoes and stuff and another lo logistical need I was thinking will be more uh, more people on the ground that work for the city the power company they need to take it seriously because there's families out there that really need these infrastructures the lower income neighborhoods are the ones that suffer the most the power grid just needs to be very efficient for everyone. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that synthesizes into a lot of times what we want is the toys, the infrastructure, but what we actually need are the people and the people on the ground to make these things happen. Thanks so much for sharing, Anita. Belvin. Okay. I was just going to say that we are in South Shore and we work in a couple of different spaces as far as cooperatives are concerned. Uh, and when it comes to rolling blackouts and things like that, um, we as a neighborhood <clears throat> don't really get the same type of response. Uh, for example, I think it was last, uh, maybe late fall, early winter, and we had two hours of uh, power outage that basically paralyzed our ability to do anything on that particular day with our food pantry distribution. Everything had to be done by paper and pencil, paper and pen, as opposed to just logging people in on a computer and having them get their needs met for groceries and other immediate need items. The problem that we have is that we have people that are already underserved uh, in the communities that we are in. And once that shock of a, a infrastructure compromise happens, that just basically brings everything to the brink of, uh, of collapse because people are already living on the margins. So the logistical need for us to address is that so people who have 
already experienced a whole lot of shortfalls in their socioeconomic condition and don't have to go through the added stress of a power outage or infrastructure compromise that basically sets them back even more so than where they already are set back from. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you for sharing that. That's why we got us, so we're going to make this happen. So I just want to share with everyone, when we talk about wants and needs, especially like if individuals are doing emergency planning or they're doing uh, planning for a battery co-op or anything, actually. So it's just learning to distinguish a want from a need. A lot of times people use the terms interchangeably, but a need would be water. So if you're thinking about preparedness or whatever you're thinking about, I need water. And it's going to sound funny when I say a want is clean water. So people are like, oh, why is a want clean water? And then you go back to the need, which is the know-how to clean that water. So if you're in a situation where you know you need water, you don't necessarily need clean water. If you get any type of water, that's what you need. And you also need the knowledge to take that water and to purify that water. So it's uh, good to drink. And we learn things as we live, but uh, one of the things is how to, when to boil water or when not to boil water for purification, when straining water is better, when charcoal will work, how to make charcoal, like just different things that can be used in multi-facets, but just some food for thought. So when we think about wants and needs, ultimately we're trying to refine down the needs to what the actual need is. And sometimes that's just taking a little bit extra time to think about the layer underneath what we think the obvious is. I am not a first responder, and I don't want to be an apologist for them, but I want to lay out some things for everyone to understand what can go on. A large majority of first responders do not live in communities that are affected. So in a crisis, they have to get to where the epicenter of what occurs is. Oftentimes, people do not train in departments for the worst case scenario. Like in the case of Katrina in New Orleans, General Honore Russell, the black man, he pointed out that one, people did not leave because they did not have money on hand and were waiting for checks. Katrina happened on a Thursday. Vehicles that they wanted to use were not available because they were not on high ground and they got flooded. To be short, understand what these departments do during these particular events so you have an understanding of how to manage your expectation level and be aware that there are things that you can do so that in the event that you don't give FEMA five to seven days because they're driving through things and power lines are falling and people are losing command and control where they're at a joint command center themselves. So understand that we do have a responsibility to do what we're doing now with these batteries so that we can make ourselves safe, but also we would benefit from understanding what they do so we can manage our expectation of them. A police officer does certain things which is related to policing. National Guard, state of emergency, that comes from a higher level than the governor. And that's one reason why in Katrina, certain things didn't happen because it was a Republican president and a Democratic governor. And the Democratic governor did not want to relinquish power to a Republican president. As we look at moving forward, understand some of these other elements so we have a better understanding and we're not mad and we don't have a different expectation level than we should about what might and might not happen. Thank you, Kelvin. It's always good to think about people who have different roles and what their limitations are so that we can be much more aware of what we can do.